thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you this morning. Yes, I'll, I'm going to take a broader look at the situation and hopefully answer some of the questions that were raised in the previous talk. Um, uh, starting from a CIP project called Habitats, where we were developing uh, data structures for habitats-related data, but we started with uh, real users in real situations, real people sort of saying, supposing all of this Inspire stuff were finished and in place, what would you do with it? And we asked this in, in different, to different groups of people, shepherds in Sicily, salmon fishers in Ireland, marine researchers in Spain and in Latvia, and so on and so forth. From, fr from the overall analysis of, of the whole process of interaction, uh, user-driven interaction, and its relationship to the data modeling process, we developed three broad impact scenarios, saying sort of these, these are the I would say business areas or broad areas where it might be possible for Inspire to make a, a, a big impact. The first one is the obvious one, which is about environmental stewardship, uh, those who need to take care of the environment. But the second one is a potential uh, area very interesting. The environment is something for pleasure, for learning, for education, for having fun. And the third is, is another one that was mentioned in the question to the previous speaker, which is negotiations between public authorities and economic actors for decisions that affect the environment. These are all very broad areas that should be looked for that could backwardsly finance uh, what Inspire is doing. In, th in that process, a couple of key issues emerge that I think are useful for us to look at. Number one is the fundamental importance of the engagement of end users at the beginning of the process and not at the very end. Try and find out what people are actually interested before you put all your data sets in there, before you build all your visualization tools. The second point is that people in the Inspire community are very much um, uh, concerned with the definition of standards and perhaps less uh, interested in the processes, the social processes, the political processes through which standards are actually adopted. They may make sense, but do people actually adopt them? And if they do not, why not? What kind of motivations drive people to actually think that using Inspire rather than something else is a good thing? The third point, which has happened uh, with incredible speed since Inspire, the Inspire Directive, is the driving force of mobile platforms. Everybody's thinking of things on big computer screens, but what's actually happening now is in people's pockets. And you have to start your thinking from there and work backwards, thinking of Inspire as perhaps an underlying platform in infrastructure. And when you do that, uh, Inspire can be thought of with a far broader impact and is something far more important than just, you say the just is a big just, uh, harmonizing data. Uh, we can think of Inspire as a platform for innovation in Europe and that's where I'm heading. But that also means a new role for the public sector. The public sector has to sort of rethink what it's doing, but don't worry entirely because that's happening anyway. And in fact, what we are now doing is moving uh, towards a, a, a sharply different version for what the public sector does in life. It doesn't sit and administer things according to closed uh, procedures in a sort of control mode. We now have, this is the model now being proposed by the European Commission, uh, a model which is open government, open data, open services, open decisions. Inspire can be an underlying platform for all of that. So Inspire can be thought of as a part of a fundamental infrastructure for new models of government. But, but then again, is that all governments do? Even in, even in today's world, do governments just sort of be open and sit there? No. The, 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 the new emergent key role for the public sector today is to promote innovation, and not just innovation, things like iPads and iPods, 
but innovation, the kind of territorial innovation that is, is linked to what a region, uh, a people are capable of doing with the resources they have, the cultural, social, natural resources, uh, using ICT platform, and that could be thought of as, as the role of Inspire towards territorial innovation. If any of you, you are involved in uh, regional policy right now, regions are rethinking their uh, what it's called smart specialization strategies for the next uh, programming period. And there is a very strong role of what they call social innovation in there. What Inspire can be is the platform for social innovation in a territorial sense. And that's a big job. That's, that's really thinking big. So what this is coming from work we're doing now in uh, regional development, trying to understand what happens with innovation. If, if we're beyond the sort of old-fashioned logic where you get a cute idea in a university and then you, through some technology transfer incubator you try and put it in the market and then maybe at the end try and figure out if people are interested in it or not. Uh, you, you look at the different types of innovation on the same plane, as it were, and you see institutional innovation is there together with everyone else, which means that in order for integrated territorial innovation to happen, governments cannot just sit there and say, you're my territory, I'll make you innovative by giving money to this or that person. Governments have to say, I'm part of the game, I have to innovate together with you, you help me innovate. So in several projects that we're working on now, governments are playing with different roles of promoting and coordinating innovation. Government can be a policymaker, of course. This is rather standard, and here is simply a list of recommendations coming on from one project about territorial innovation. Governments can be mediators, repositioning citizens, and this is a planning process, is something a little closer to inspire an e-participation project, where if governments reposition the role of citizens through participatory mechanisms, and again, keep thinking inspire, could be underneath all of this. Uh, this is a, a new role as government in mediating between the interests of citizens in the interests of the private sector. Government is procurer. Maybe some of you are aware of pre-commercial procurement, something which, uh, a policy which is taking the innovation policy by the, 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 totally revolutionizing it, where government transforms normal procurement processes into sort of uh, contests for ideas. What, this should be the kind of method to drive uh, the, the role of environmental stewardship and monitoring. This could be the thing that unlocks uh, a totally different and new market for Inspire. Pre-commercial procurement, watch out for what's going to happen in regional policy in your area to see if they're actually going to be adopting it. The commission has carried out some, uh, some pilot tests. The uh, Italian ministry is just closing this Friday a call to the southern regions to express their innovation needs for procurement. And again, in, uh, Inspire can have a big role there. Government is partner. This does come from the uh, pilot test in the Madonia, where the government and the private sector for, were looking at different roles they could have in the flow of capture and validation of user-generated information. So some of the some of the costs where where government generally sort of does everything could be done by citizens, but then you need the private sector there to help perhaps validate the information and make it official. But then again, that's opening up totally the role of government to collaboration with citizens. Government is caretaker. The government can look at what we have conceived here as an open data commons, a general space where environmental, social, economic data could all flow together. And the government can be there to make sure that this is a process which is transparent, open, that rights are respected, and so on and so forth. Or government is peer. Government can sit down with citizens and businesses and say, look, we have a problem. Let's see what we can do to solve it together. So social validation is what we call the process that we uh, tried starting from the end of the citizen, the business, the end user, rather than the end uh, fr starting from the data provider. And it highlights the importance of processes for, of adoption. When a public authority sees that their constituency is interested and needs and has co-designed with them services that rely on Inspire, of course they're going to adopt it. They're not going to adopt it if somebody just writes a letter saying you have to adopt it. And that's, a, that's a, I think, a, a critical for the, the Inspire policy in the coming years. 
this, again, re requires looking at new scenarios of what citizens might be doing, what governments might be doing, how might these adoption processes change. So that means that the, social, the, the, uh, pri the public sector itself must realize that it has to innovate along with its people and its territory in order for anything to happen. But fortunately, new models are being explored in a lot of places and a lot of projects, very much outside the Inspire community, but, but it would be interesting for you to look at them. And thus we can think of Inspire, and it would be interesting to think of Inspire for the future as one of the keystones of a platform for European innovation where, where regional policy, territorial policy can make the, the large kind of transformations that are going to be required to meet the, the very serious challenges that Europe faces today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jesse, thank you very much. That was a very inspiring thing. So how can we turn Inspire into an, an incubator for regional innovation? Any questions from the floor? Oh yes, we have a question here from a very expert in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Thank you. I know I have a short question. Um, you created a, a, a big role for the public sector to play in innovation. Now, the public sector and civil servants are not typically, stereotypically speaking, known for their creativity, innovation, willingness to move swiftly. So what realistically is the chance that they take on any of the different roles that you have outlined for them? Uh, they're desperate. <laughs> They've run out of money. Uh, they, they are desperate. The whole the social innovation is something what a lot of us say we've been doing this for decades. All of a sudden, the, the commission has woken up. There's no more money to buy policy and to buy innovation. So public sector is having to open up with to collaboration with citizens and, and that is transforming everything. It's, it's happening. Though I do agree, it's very interesting to observe what happens. Thank you very much, Jesse. And thank